and again because I know that sometimes if you if you've only joined you won't see what's in the chat before you join yeah okay. is I'm, that the, that's the mushrooms from planter b yeah 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 oh, so cool. this, I'll put it in again <laughs> could, uh, could folks put in the chat where where they're from yeah that sounds great yeah, and, and put in the chat if you have ever gone hunting for mushrooms. <laughs> uh, pre are you a mushroom predator? <laughs> oh. oh. Okay, well, um, I guess I'm going to do the introductions. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming um, to Fungi and Plants, an Essential Relationship. I'm Katherine Thompson. I'm the co-chair along with Steve Chesler, who is here, of the Friends of Bushwick Inlet Park. Lucky for us, Steve is gonna operate the Zoom ground control tonight. Um, the Friends of Bushwick Inlet Park is an all volunteer organization dedicated to realizing, protecting and serving Bushwick Inlet Park. We create and fundraise for the programs as well as advocate for building out the rest of the park. Uh, I would like to thank Julie Marlowe, who is here tonight, um, Trina McKeever, and Steve, who worked on putting together tonight's program. And especially thank you to our special guest, mycologist Luke Sarantoni, for joining us, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. Um, so why fungus, mushrooms? Um, I think it started a couple of years ago when we became really curious about this mysterious circle of mushrooms that appeared around a tree down in the Bushwick Inlet. We learned that people call that phenomenon a fairy ring, and it's really good, a really good sign, but we wanted to know why. And then we started hearing about permaculture and agricultural ecosystems, and we wanted to know more. So it turns out that the more you learn about the world of mycology, the more fascinating it becomes. And so we thought it would be really interesting and fun to bring in a true expert in the field to give us an in-depth and introduction to the world of mycology. So without further ado, I introduce to you Luke Sarantonio. And um, Luke, I'm going to just give you a little bit of bio on Luke now. Um, Luke uh, grew up in a small rural town in the upper Hudson Valley Catskill region, about two hours north of New York City, and spent much of his childhood exploring the fascinating interwoven ecosystems that make up this unique natural landscape. In college at SUNY ESF, he was blessed to work under some truly inspiring minds in the world of life sciences and mycology, which is if you don't already know, the study of fungi. Following his passion through travels in the Pacific Northwest and work on a shiitake farm in the Finger Lake regions of New York, he eventually landed back in the Hudson Valley. Currently, he is working to develop education programming and mushroom-based products under the name of Mycophilic, for the love of fungi. So with Luke, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be with you all. Um, and uh, let's jump right in. There's a lot to talk about. Obviously, we can't touch on everything. There is, it's just this vast, vast world. But um, we're going to see what we can. What we can. Possible as valuable as possible for you. So as Todd alluded to before, I'll provide some commentary just on the world as we see it at the moment, where we think we're headed. Only probably scratch the surface of what is that? I don't know. If every, if, it would be really great if you're not um, already muted uh, to mute yourself. Seems like somebody else is giving a presentation too. That sounds pretty interesting. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to jump right into mine. I'm going to share my screen. And share. And jump in. Okay, let's see here. 
One second there. Just tried opening Photoshop on me. Let me just make sure that's not happening. It'll slow everything down. Uh, it'll probably be okay. Okay. So fungi and plants, an essential relationship. Um, we're going to start way back from kind of the beginnings of life on land. Um, this is uh, a fossil that was dated to about a billion years ago. Um, it's what they think is maybe the first um, presence of chitin um, in the fossil record. And chitin is this, um, it's the structure that's similar to cellulose, like plants have, um, but it is composed um, fungi cell walls are composed of this material. Um, it's also in uh, arthropod uh, exoskeletons, as well as in the beaks of um, different types of um, arthropods as well, um, or cephalopods. Um, but this is the first uh, fossil record of that. Then we're going to jump forward a little bit. Um, so we have a fossil of some of the earliest vascular plants. So vascular plants, um, some people kind of call them the higher plants. Um, they are these plants that have vascular tissue, meaning that they can transport uh, water up their stems and they can transport sugars and nutrients um, up and down as well. Um, but this is the evidence of some of the earliest, earliest uh, fossilized um, vascular plants. So they believe that uh, liverworts, um, the earliest liverworts, um, which are kind of before that, some of the relations of mosses uh, may have appeared um, on land, at least in the fossil record, about uh, 473 million years ago. Um, and then later on, vascular plants. Um, but these early, early plants um, in these fossils, they can actually find remnants of fungi within these cells. And we'll talk about these specific types of fungi um, in just a moment here. So now we're going to jump forward a little bit further. So this is a fossil on the left you see here. Um, they call this fossil um, or this specific organism Prototaxides. And Prototaxides, they believe, was a fungal structure. Um, it may have been some kind of symbiotic uh, relationship between a plant and a fungus, um, but it created these massive, massive dome uh, type of structures. Uh, you can see an artist's rendition here. And at that time, um, land plants were only about a meter tall, so about three feet tall, um, while these, um, what they believe were fungal structures, if they were standing on end, which they believe they may have been, they may have been up to 26 feet tall. So if you can think about these massive fungal structures about 26 feet tall, while the land plants were just about three feet tall. Um, pretty amazing. We're gonna jump ahead a little bit further. Um, this is the earliest fossil of um, an actual mushroom structure. Um, we can see this. Um, this was around the time they believe that um, the massive supercontinent was breaking apart. Um, and they believe that this mushroom likely fell into a stream um, in what became Brazil, I believe, and was covered up very quickly with some kind of sediment. Um, there's very little evidence of fungi or mushrooms in the fossil record because they are very often very fleshy. And so they don't really preserve very well, but it's likely that this one was um, in a perfect situation and fell and was covered over with sediments very quickly. But you can see these already before um, much of life was even developed as we know it. Um, you know, animals weren't developed as we know it. We already see these structures of mushrooms developed. We'll jump ahead a little bit further. Um, just about a, a hundred million years ago, you can see um, in amber fungal structures as well. But um, just to step back really quickly, I want to just um, briefly talk about this emergence of life onto land, this emergence of plants onto land. Um, they believe that um, because of this um, visibility of fungi within these early, early plant fossils, that fungi may have helped plants to move onto land. Um, fungi and plants are really this perfect partnership. Um, fungi are um, taking in oxygen, just like we do, and they're releasing CO2. Plants are doing that opposite. Um, they're taking in that CO2, releasing oxygen. Um, Fungi are really amazing at breaking down different types of minerals, different types of rock. In this early uh, time of the early planet, about a billion years ago or um, 500 million years ago, it was very volcanic on land. Um, there was very little nutrients. And if you think about these early plants where um, it's kind of like algaes and things like that, they didn't have any root structure. So they needed some way to absorb things. Um, and fungi may have been that early kind of helper to break down those rocks, releasing these nutrients. Um, and then the plants may have um, shared these sugars that they're photosynthesizing from the atmosphere. Plants take in that CO2 and create 
glucose and simple sugars. Um, so it's believed by a lot of different um, scientists that fungi and plants may have aided each other in coming onto land. Now we have just this uh, very simple kind of um, depiction of our relationships, the relationships of the major groupings of uh, organisms on the planet. And as you can see, I just want to briefly point out, um, as you can see, uh, plants split off um, and then later on, fungi and animals split off. So we actually share about 50% of our DNA with fungi. And for that reason, um, a lot of different compounds and things like that, that are produced by fungi affect us very in all different ways, um, a lot of them beneficial. Um, and we can talk about that with medicine and all that in a little bit. Um, but we're just gonna kind of briefly, we are focusing uh, on plants and fungi connections, but uh, just kind of briefly, go over um, some early interactions of humans with fungi. Um, so this is uh, the jawbone of a body that was found um, in Spain. And it was dated to about 19,000 years ago. Um, and there were pieces of mushrooms in the teeth um, of this jawbone. Um, really, really amazing. If you think about 19,000 years, really, really early humanoids. Um, I mean, obviously humans as we know were developed, but. Um, uh, you know, very early civilization. And it's hard to really know exactly how they were using these mushrooms at that time, if they were using them mostly as edibles, or if they were using them as a medicinal or some type of um, entheogen. So entheogens are these different um, herbal compounds, mushroom compounds, um, these different things that people are using um, culturally, not quite as a recreational type of thing, but often mind altering types of things. And so um, some people believe in this stoned ape hypothesis, which is that um, these early human, early hominids were um, following, they were hunter gatherers and they were following these herds of animals. Um, and as they follow these herds of animals, um, they would find these um, remnants of what the animals left behind, this droppings of the animals. And in these subtropical regions where we likely developed um, the main thing that grows on these droppings was a psychedelic mushroom called Psilocybe cubensis, which is actually the one that's consumed the most widely in the uh, world right now. Um, but there are a lot of different theories um, that early humanoids or early humans may have consumed these mushrooms um, over thousands and thousands of years. Um, and it may have changed their perspective in a way that led to the possibility of the use of tools and maybe along with the cooking of food, um, this kind of development of that prefrontal cortex um, that is unique to humans. We're gonna jump ahead a little bit further. Um, this is a cave painting that was dated to about uh, 11,000 to 8,000 years, um, was found in Algeria. Um, and you can see mushrooms all along the edge of this body. Um, and they believe it was some type of shaman, maybe the keeper of these specific mushrooms. Um, and you can see there's just so much presence um, of fungi within their, their cultures. Um, some of you may have know, know about this uh, man that was found in the Swiss Alps. Um, I believe he was found in about 1996 or 95. And um, it was this body. Some hikers were hiking through the Alps and they came across a body half frozen in the ice. And they thought it was somebody that had died. And so they called in search and rescue and search and rescue came in and they saw all these tattoos that were very tribal and the body looked very old and, uh, but still very intact. And they were like, wow, we got to call in some archeologists first before we like unearth this body. Cause it was half in the ice. And um, so they came in and they discovered that it, they dated it to about 5,300 years. And um, on this body were all these different things um, and they were able to find you could you should look up uh otzi the Iceman if you're interested um but some of the things that were found on his body were two different uh mushroom species and one of them was the tinder conch the tinder conch can be used for um carrying fire from one uh day to the next so for instance you can grab a coal out of your fire from the previous night in the morning maybe you find some smoldering coals you can drop it into this mushroom and carry it throughout the day um, and, and flick it out onto your uh, tinder for your next uh, day's fire. Um, they also think he may have been using this uh, for some type of therapeutic um, or antimicrobial uses. He had all these um, tattooed dots all over his body and they think that maybe he was doing like a low intensity burn uh, type of thing or heating, um, almost like acupuncturists would use needles. Um, a lot of those dots actually corresponded with the meridians that acupuncturists used. 
we could go on forever with that, but uh, we got to get on. Um, you can see some uh, evidence of the Mayan culture. Uh, the Maya used mushrooms very extensively, and you can see in these stone carvings, um, they are very connected with fungi. Uh, you can see it in Greece as well. Our time is finite, so we're going to zoom through. Um, in Siberia and northern Scandinavia, um, there's this very deep connection with the Amanita muscaria. Uh, a lot of people know this is like the Mario mushroom. It's, it's red with white spots. Um, it does have um, mind-altering compounds within it, um, not the same as the typical cubensis that people are consuming, um, but it's very tied in with their culture. Um, and if we have time at the end, I can talk a little bit more about that. Okay, cool. But what are fungi? Fungi, the main structure of fungi is called mycelium. And mycelium is this kind of branching like structure. You can see it here in this picture. Um, you can often pull back some leaves on the ground um, in the forest or even in a park. And you can pull back some leaves and you can often see this mycelial structure. And that's the main structure of the fungus. You can almost think of a fungus as being like a fruit tree. And that fruit tree is that mycelium. And then the fruit or the apple that the fruit tree produces is the mushroom. And so the mushroom is just that fruiting body of that main mycelial mass. And um, mycelium produces what we call an extracellular enzyme. And those enzymes are extracellular, meaning they're outside of the cells. They release this liquid enzyme. Um, and it's many, many different types of enzymes that they release depending on the species and what they're decomposing. But they release it into the material that they're living on or in. And then it decomposes that material and then they suck it all back in, all these juices, all this material and sugars. And as they grow through and they're softening it as they're decomposing it and being able to grow through that. So this is a kind of, people often uh, separate fungi into kind of major groupings. We often uh, separate things into categories to kind of understand them a little bit more as humans. It helps us too. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, the mushrooms kind of fall more on a continuum, some of them bridge the gap between different categories. But um, we're kind of going to talk about these basic categories really, really briefly. But uh, this first one that we're going to talk about is decomposers. So these are fungi that are decomposing dead material. Some of them are doing decomposing cellulose and lignin. Some of them are just decomposing the cellulose, leaving the lignin behind. Um, sometimes you'll see what they call brown rot or cubic rot. And that's that rot that's breaking into cubes sometimes. And it'll be brown in color because uh, the fungi are breaking down the cellulose leaving this brown lignin behind. And they may be opportunists. Um, they sometimes will come in as a tree is starting to die and they decompose that dying tissue. And sometimes that can lead to death and sometimes they're slightly parasitic. Um, there's a lot going on and we're still learning more and more. Sometimes they're finding that different things that might live in the tree while they're alive and be maybe beneficial living alongside then become decomposers as the tree dies. But they arrive at different times they compose different, decompose different materials. So um, for instance, shiitake uh, like to be what they call primary decomposers. They come in really early. They like to be those first ones to come in. And then they kind of decompose, and decompose with that enzymes that they are producing. And then another fungus comes in that can maybe utilize some of the other things that they left behind. You know, it's like, uh, you go to a party, right? And you know, there's a whole lot of food and you eat kind of the things that you want. And then somebody shows up and they're like, hey man, you like left all this food behind. You might not like it, but I really like it. So I'm gonna eat all this and then on and on. And so you have all these different kind of levels of decomposition happening. We also have a uh, parasitic fungi. These are things that are breaking or feeding off of living things, um, living hosts. And again, some things kind of bridge the gap between those two different things. This is a parasitic fungus that I found. It's a um, false puffball that you can see here, um, or an earth ball, um, parasitizing this uh, bolete or suillus fungus. Um, really interesting relationship there. Some other uh, different decomposers and parasites. So this is a parasitic fungus called honey mushrooms. Um, actually the largest organism in the world, they believe by mass is a honey mushroom, uh, possibly underneath Oregon or in Michigan. Uh, there are two massive ones, and you can actually look at aerial photos, and you can see their uh, root rot fungi, so they travel between the roots of different trees, and you can see the die-offs in long, long strips, basically, because they go out in these radiating lines. Then we have endophytes. Uh, endophytes are living within plants, endo meaning inside, phyte, plants. Um, so there are these different types of fungi living within plants, um, and they impart different types of 
uh, things to the plants, uh, different types of uh, maybe protection against herbivory, different types of compounds that could protect them from being eaten. Um, a lot, we're actually finding that a lot of different compounds that we find to be medicinal within plants are actually produced by fungi that are always there living within the plants. Um, actually, one thing I believe I learned recently, uh, spearmint flavor. So the taste of spearmint is actually an endophytic fungus within the plant. Um, and so it's kind of a question of like, are they separate or are they one entity? Because they always appear together. Then we have mycorrhizal. So this is the one we're going to kind of focus on today. Um, so mycorrhizal are these fungi that form connections with the roots of different types of plants. And uh, as you can see here in my bullet point, um, about 85 to 95 percent of uh, land plants actually rely on fungi. And so when we talked about the fossils, um, the early vascular plants were found with these mycorrhizal fungi, um, beneficial uh, relationships going on with inside their cells. And so there's these two major groupings um, of ectomycorrhizae. Um, one of them is called uh, of mycorrhizae, one of them is called ectomycorrhizae, ecto meaning outside. They form these sheaths around the roots of the plants and they uh, transfer different types of nutrients um, and water. Fungi are really amazing at utilizing nutrients and uh, water uptake and they branch out very, very quickly and very, um, very frequently. So they're able to utilize the soil much more than the plants are. So Sometimes when plants grow and they try to take in nutrients and water, they actually create this um, nutrient zone that is depleted around the root and fungi can help them to kind of branch out and get some of that nutrients that's without outside of their zone and outside of their absorption zone. And then we have our muscular mycorrhizae, which are these fungi that create these amazing uh, structures inside of the cells of fungi or of plants, sorry, and the plants um, actually allow the fungi to come in um, and the fungi will break this, they'll find a perfect cell that's really good for transporting with, for sharing its nutrients and getting sugars from the plant. Um, these fungi need sugars. Decomposer fungi are able to decompose wood and get sugars out of that. These mycorrhizal fungi need to get it from the plants because they can't do that. And they form these really beautiful uh, tree-like structures. As you can see, arbuscule, arbol or arbor um, is kind of the root for um, tree. And we'll kind of see some of that here. I have some photos. If you look inside of the roots of plants, you can often see these microscopically and they're beautiful. Um, but one person really quickly before I get on, um, if you're interested in mycorrhizae, look up Suzanne Samard. She has some amazing videos on YouTube. Um, she's really just blowing my mind in that world. Here are some ectomycorrhizal root tips. So the uh, roots in response to the fungi actually create these really beautiful uh, root tips and they are all unique and every species has slightly different morphotypes. They call them different um, structures that they cause the plant to form these different species of fungi. And you can actually look at those root tips and be able to identify the species of fungi through that. So here are some examples of some ectomycorrhizal fungi. So these are different types of um, mushrooms that will grow um, alongside different trees. And so you'll find them often. You can look for certain trees if you're looking for certain types of mushrooms. These are all things that I've taken, different photos I've taken in the past year. Um, we have some beautiful boletes in the center there, a uh, hedgehog mushroom there with the spines coming down, really amazing edible. Um, we have some uh, cinnabar chanterelle and an amanita. Within the amanitas, we have that red uh, amanita with the white spots that we talked about. Um, they're also some of the most deadly mushrooms within the amanita, but they create these uh, relationships with the plant, these ectomycorrhizal relationships. And then we have this, uh, what, what I was talking about before, these arbuscules, these amazing structures. So what will happen is the um, fungi will break the cell wall, this cellulose cell wall that the plants have. And instead of rupturing this cell membrane, which holds all the organelles and all the moisture inside of the cell, the um, cell membrane will divide perfectly as the fungus divides into the cell. And so that they have perfect contact at every point. And it's amazing. They form these beautiful tree-like structures and are able to transport um, different nutrients and sugars back and forth very simply, and very easily. Um, so just briefly, really quickly, um, our muscular mycorrhizae create this compound called glomalin. I actually learned about glomalin just a few years ago. I didn't really know anything that it even existed. I didn't know it was something, um, but it's an amazing compound. Um, it is um, 
really responsible for holding all that nutrients in the soil, um, really getting, keeping it from leaching away. As you can see all the different functions here, um, glomalin is an amazing structure and it's created by these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So just a few fun facts. Um, this is a little bit wordy, but um, phosphorus is one of the main limiting nutrients within terrestrial systems. And that's one of the main nutrients that um, uh, mycorrhizal fungi are transporting and sharing with these plants. Um, but fungi can also provide different growth hormones to the plants, pathogen resistance, especially with ectomycorrhizal, the ones that form these sheaths around the outside. Um, and they can also increase the solubility of soil minerals and things like that. Um, something I learned relatively recently as well, um, they really, um, without the mycorrhizae, the tropical rainforest wouldn't exist because the tropical rainforests have such shallow root systems um, that the minerals and nutrients would all just basically leach out if the fungi weren't there to kind of hold them in and store all that sugar, all those nutrients and water for these different plants and things like that. But um, in general, about 5% of land plants form ectomycorrhizal relationships. Um, most of these are trees, um, different types of conifers and some deciduous trees. Um, and then when it comes to arbuscular mycorrhizal, these are these really massive powerhouses, about 80% of land plants. Um, brassicas are one of the few families that doesn't actually form relationships with mycorrhizae. Um, one of my professors in school actually used to uh, say that brassicas just, they're not plants because they don't form mycorrhizal connections. <laughs> pretty interesting and hilarious, but then there are some that do both. They do micro echo and endo or arbuscular mycorrhizae, uh, things like alder, aspen, eucalyptus, willow. I'm just going to check my time here. Um, but this is very wordy. Um, this is kind of just like uh, just a little quick synopsis of like what can happen within monocultural systems. We have these massive farms that we farm the food to support our massive, massive populations um, in the world. And in a lot of situations, we end up forming these monocultures and uh, monocultures can be really, really uh, detrimental to the environment and detrimental to the different types of relationships going on underground. So if you read this, you can see that what happens is that the um, soil nutrients is, can be depleted over time, especially if you're doing monoculture. They're, those plants are all pulling the same thing and they're trying to pull that same, same thing. And the fungi have less to trade with these plants. Um, and so they may kind of weaken or not be there in some cases. Um, and this pathogenic resistance that is imparted by the fungi kind of um, isn't really there, is very weak. And so in response, a lot of big farmers will add large amounts of fungicides to kill these pathogenic fungi that are killing their plants. Um, and unfortunately, that's not a targeted thing. So it kills the pathogenic fungi and it kills the mycorrhizae as well. And so <laughs> there, it just cascades and cascades. And so eventually what you end up with is these soils that um, they don't aggregate. So they don't allow the infiltration of water into the soils and nutrients into the soils. And so you have these massive amounts of runoff. And then in response, people add more nutrients because they're not getting enough nutrients into their soils. And you have more and more and more and more runoff um, and into these terrestrial systems causing really big problems with um, overgrowth of algae and things like that. Um, we could go into that for quite some time, but let's get back to it. So <laughs> a lot of people don't realize, but mushrooms are the, um, they are the response of two different types or two different fungi of the same species mating with each other. Um, at that point, they can produce a, a mushroom. So before that, um, the spore lands on the ground. So a mushroom creates a spore, which is similar to a seed, um, but you can think of it more of like almost a, an egg or a sperm because it only has half the genetics that it needs. So within a seed, you have all the genetics there. Um, the plant can grow up and can form a, a whole adult plant. Um, with fungi um, and with humans and things like that, we have the half of the genetics in each of these gametes. And so um, instead of having like two individual things, like for instance, with humans, we often call them two different sexes. Um, with fungi, they have many, many different mating types depending on the species. So for instance, white button mushrooms that you might find in the grocery store have two different mating types. So that means that there are two different combinations that can come together and form a new uh, viable fungus that can produce a mushroom. Um, so 
basically what happens, just briefly, these spores land of the same species, and they shoot out this small thread-like structure that they call hyphae, and it's the beginning of mycelium. And this hyphae come together and they touch each other, they find each other, and then at that point, um, they share their nuclei. And the nuclei is, um, the nucleus is um, within the cell, it's what holds all that genetic material, that DNA. And what happens inside these cells is they actually share their nuclei um, and the nuclei float next to each other inside of each cell. And they call that dikaryotic because there's two different karyotes within the same cell. And then at that point, the mushroom or the fungus can produce a mushroom. Um, and within that mushroom, um, the two spore, the two nuclei fuse together. So that's the two different genetic material from the two original parents that fuses together. Um, and then at that point, um, those things that fuse together will um, recombine and divide. And then you have um, typically with a mushroom type of, of fungus, there are different types of fungi, but um, they produce this club-like shape they call the basidia or basidium. And on that club-like shape, there are these four spines and off of each spine, a spore forms. And then it is released off into the atmosphere and hope in hopes that it'll find another mating partner and form a brand new relationship. Um, and when it's released, there's actually this really amazing release structure, this mechanism where the spore is kind of shaped almost like a little bean, like an asymmetrical bean. And you have a small droplet right here that's starting to form. Can everybody see me, I hope? A small droplet that forms right here. And we call that Buller's drop. This guy named Buller in, or, uh, discovered it. And uh, it's the small droplet forms and it has a little bit of sugars in it and it attracts moisture. And so moisture condenses onto it. At the same time, we have a little bit of a film of moisture that develops around this side of the spore. And until the spore is perfectly mature. And then the surface tension can't be held any longer by this droplet of water. And it breaks the surface tension, just like if you're uh, thinking about raindrops, sometimes you'll find like a droplet of water and you can touch it with your finger and it breaks. And it actually breaks the surface tension and connects with this film of water or, or moisture around the edge of the spore. And it flings off. And it's actually been clocked at more Gs than the space shuttle taking off, um, which is kind of crazy. Huge amount of force. Then it hits the air column and it can actually slow down really, really quickly. But sometimes so many spores are released at once, it can form this kind of foil or almost like we were seeing before in that uh, video that I showed in the beginning of the mushrooms being released. They form this like foil of spores that floats off and into the atmosphere. Um, this is an example of a fungus that has many mating types. Like I said before, the white button mushroom just has two different mating types. So two different combinations. This one has 23,000. So if you can think about that, it's the most ubiquitous fungus in the world. Uh, it's called Schizophyllum. There are a couple different species within that genus. And so it can have 23,000 different uh, uh, things that can recombine and create a new viable fruiting fungus. Um, so if you think about it, it's very, very adaptable. Um, it has this wide array of genetics, can utilize all different environments. Um, a species of this was actually found. Um, they took a core sample of some rock in deep sea vents in the underneath the ocean, and they uh, ground up some of this rock and they sprinkled it onto a petri dish. You might know what a petri dish is. It's often used in labs to grow things. Um, and it has this medium on it that's uh, made from uh, seaweed. They call it agar. And it's this gel medium that has the moisture um, within it. And they sprinkled this dust onto this uh, plate. And it started growing mycelium of this species or this specific genus of fungi. And it started fruiting mushrooms on the petri dish from something that they cored out of the uh, deep sea vents out of the rock. So pretty crazy. They've also put this one into um, deep space and pulled it back in and it starts fruiting again almost immediately. Um, a lot of lichens they've also done that with. So that kind of, um, some people believe that um, in this theory they call panspermia, the possibility that fungi may have come to land on some kind of, or to earth on some kind of like asteroid or some kind of comet. Um, we know that they do survive in um, the upper atmosphere and out in space and can reproduce as soon as they get into um, favorable conditions. It's hard to know exactly. Um, that is a theory that a lot of people do believe, but um, there are a lot of different um, things that could break down that theory. Uh, so we have two major groupings of fungi. We're not going to get into it. 
right now because it is very vast, but the two major groupings that we can think of are basidiomycetes. And that's that one we talked about with the life cycle that has this kind of basidium club shape that the spores form on. And they can make all different types of mushrooms, so many different species, so many different shapes. All of them go back to this main structure within the gills or the pores. We have uh, some chanterelles here. We have some hedgehog fungi, some uh, beautiful coral shaped fungi. These all are in the same grouping. They all form that basidium structure. And then we have ascomycetes and ascomycetes form a sac like structure they call the ASCII. And um, we have many different structures within them. So things like morels and false morels you can see in this photo and uh, beautiful cup fungi, this um, green cup fungus. And actually some people might see this green stain on wood that you can see in this photo. It's actually um, the mycelium stains the wood this color. And then not frequently, but sometimes you can find the fruiting bodies, which is that next photo over these beautiful um, greenish blue uh, cup fungi and the sacs of the, um, the ASCII that I was talking about that form the spores are lined up inside that cup. And spores are dispersed in many different ways. They can be dispersed by wind, by rain, um, by humans or other animals. Some of, um, spores can go through digestive systems. So um, different types of animals will eat them and pass them on. Um, this is a cool example. This is a grouping called um, ink or ink caps. And uh, it's a genus often called coprinus. Um, I, th I think all the ink caps are within that genus coprinus. And they have very, very, very dense, tightly packed gills. And so tightly packed that when they mature, the spores won't even be able to come out of the gills. So instead, they reach full maturity. And this one that looks beautiful and white um, and cream colored is at maturity. And it's about to reach into this next stage. And from the bottom up, they call it deliquescence. And it uh, turns into this slimy sludge from the bottom up and washes all the spores down the stem or onto the ground. And then they wash away and they're dispersed by the rain as it flows. And hopefully they find some new uh, places to pass on that genetic material, the new next generation. So we're gonna get into some relationships of plants. Let's check our time here. So we're getting down to it, but um, there are many different relationships with plants. We talked about mycorrhizal fungi and kind of there's meeting mycorrhizae um, and also things like lichen. So for instance, we have, <laughs> it's a silly joke. Um, so I like an analogy get married, they'd taken a, or a algae and a fungus get married, they'd taken a lichen to each other. Um, it's actually much more complicated than that. We're actually now finding that instead of just one fungus and one algae, in a lot of cases, they're actually multi-fungi. And um, actually, I think in most cases that they're finding, there's actually an ascomycete that we talked about and a basidiomycete, um, both living together with this algae and forming these beautiful lichen structures. And um, it's likely that the Algaes are um, photosynthesizing, sharing those sugars with the fungi. And the fungi are growing and protecting the algae maybe and uh, helping with uh, water absorption and breaking down the rocks maybe if the um, lichen are growing on rocks um, to release nutrients. Um, and it's hard to really know what's going on if it's a mutualistic relationship or not. Um, there are a lot of studies that have found that maybe it's not quite so mutualistic of a relationship. Um, so orchids, uh, this is a a uh, pink lady slipper that I found uh, this past year. Um, these specific orchids um, are really unique, but orchids in general, um, they don't tend to have enough storage of nutrients within their seeds to actually come above the soil and um, start photosynthesizing and creating their own sugars. Um, and sometimes the seeds are actually um, so tight that they can't break that out. So they rely on fungi um, in the early forms of their life, the early stages when they're still in the seed to help them form this relationship with them and give them sugars that they maybe got from another plant that is photosynthesizing. Um, and in the case of actually these uh, pink lady slippers I just learned recently, um, the mycelium will actually, um, the seed apparently looks a little bit almost like a coffee grass, like a, yeah, it's almost like a piece of uh, like a coffee bean or something like that. It has this like um, center line through it or this kind of um, general uh, section through the center of it. And 
the mycelium can actually go in and pry this seed open and to help it germinate and grow and go up above the soil. And actually this orchid will then um, fight the fungus after, um, once it's gone above the soil and it'll actually in some cases kill the fungus, which is really interesting. Um, this fungus also is found to kill um, or be parasitic on different types of pines. So it's hard to really like, it's a really interesting relationship because you have these um, orchids are like being helped and they're shooting their shoots up above the soil uh, level and being able to photosynthesize. And then they're like, you know, I don't really need you anymore, fungus. I'm going to kill you. And, you know, you're not really that cool because you're killing this, um, you're a parasite on this pine over here. So uh, I don't know. But parasites are all within this ecosystem. You know, they're um, all functioning and controlling the ecosystem. So a lot of parasites are kind of these biological controls that make sure that populations don't grow out of control um, in different situations. Um, the only problem there is that we've um, changed our environment so much that a lot of in a lot of cases these parasites and different things will overgrow in more more of situations and worse situations than they typically would in the natural environment because of how we've changed things. Uh, here are some different what we call achlorophilus plants. So achlorophilus means that they never form any chlorophyll. Um, they start their life and they connect with fungi um, who are getting the chlor or the sugars from another plant that does have chlorophyll, like a tree or something like that, or an herbaceous plant. And um, they, it's an interesting relationship. Um, I kind of sometimes like to think of it as like, you know, it's kind of this, the plant is this friend that's like, you know, staying on your couch, but they're not really paying your rent. And they also kind of eat your food here and there. Um, but they're just, you know, they're just kind of hanging out. Um, but uh, they never form any, uh, green structures and their whole life cycle, they're sapping off of these fungi. Um, and sometimes they're really beautiful. Uh, this one actually in the middle, I just found yesterday. Um, they call that one, uh, somebody just told me recently, I hadn't heard this common name, uh, they call it bear corn. Um, and it was fruiting in huge abundance. I went on a, a, I hosted a morel walk yesterday through our local mycological society and we found a lot of morels, um, but this sometimes is seen as uh, it grows around the same time and it can be a lookalike. So some morel hunters will see it and be like, ah, oh, man, I hate that one. Because they, uh, you know, they think that they found a morel and they get really excited. Um, and then we have some other, um, uh, these are all found in New York, actually. I, I took all these photos. Um, other achlorophilus, um, non-chlorophyll forming plants. Um, they also call them mycoheterotrophs because they're getting their food off of the fungi, the myco. Um, the one on, the one of the root structure here, that's called a uh, coral root. That's another uh, orchid type. Um, I think it's related to orchids, but it's uh, also non-chlorophyll producing. And then here's one other. Um, this one uh, is most often pure white. Um, this is one of the only times I actually found a pink version. Um, they call it uh, ghost pipe, Indian pipe, um, something like that. There are a couple common names for it. Uh, Monotropa uniflora is a scientific name, um, and it does the same kind of relationship. It um, forms a relationship with the fungi and gets sugars that the fungi are getting from another plant. Okay, so we talked about all these different fungi and how they work. Um, and there are so many different ways that we can use them, utilize the powers of fungi. Um, you know, growing up, we don't really learn that much in the US about mushrooms or about different types of fungi. Um, I didn't learn about really about mushrooms until I was in college. Um, I learned a little bit when I was younger, but um, I went into school as an aquatics and fisheries major and I discovered fungi and I was, my mind was blown. I was completely fascinated with all the amazing intricacies and interesting relationships. And uh, I changed my major and was able to uh, take a lot of different classes in that realm of fungi and um, actually more broadly um, be able to study kind of an ecological, be able to have a more ecological view by taking different um, classes and different disciplines. But um, some of the things that you can do is you can create uh, outdoor beds in or surrounding your garden. Um, they can be really good because they can protect the plants in your garden from different types of pathogens. Um, sometimes this uh, honey mushroom that I talked about before, that parasitic fungus can come in and be parasitic on your different types of plants. And um, so fungi can often help in that situation. You can create these beds surrounding your garden as a barrier and they can be really good um, for breaking down the different nutrients within these, often people do like wood chip beds and it's breaking down these wood chips and releasing the nutrients. Um, and then 
if the mycorrhizal fungi are in high abundance there, they are then grabbing those nutrients and dispersing it to the different plants within your garden. Um, you can also produce food. Uh, there are some really great mushrooms that you can form uh, different beds with. Uh, one of the really major ones that people are using is uh, uh, wine caps and wine caps um, grow really, really abundantly. They're really, really amazing fruiters and they can be pretty good edibles. A lot of people are eating them. Um, and then also you can um, do logs. So I worked on a shiitake mushroom farm in the Finger Lakes um, as an intern for a year. And we had about 1200 logs and um, you, they're very low maintenance um, in most cases. Um, you do have to move them around if you want them to produce in a regular pattern, um, you have to soak them and then pull them out of the water, usually soak for about uh, 24 hours, although people are now finding that much less time um, will stimulate mushrooms to fruit. Um, but it can be a really great way to produce mushrooms in your area, right in your backyard. Some people are buying already inoculated logs, but um, typically they take a little bit longer. So when you're growing on logs, um, it'll take about a year before the mushroom will fruit. So the fungus, um, it has all this energy and it's feeding off of this log. It's a decomposer, um, but it doesn't want to put any energy into reproducing and producing a mushroom until it has to, because it's a huge amount of energy to produce a mushroom. And for all it knows, the amount of food within that log could be completely infinite. Um, it hasn't reached the edges yet, so it's got so much food. And then it reaches the edges of that log and it realizes, I need to find new food. This is the total amount of food within this log. So it starts producing mushrooms. And then um, if you do logs, you can typically get fruiting for five, six, almost seven years in some cases um, consecutively from one log. Um, whereas if you're growing on sawdust or something like that, um, you typically will get uh, fruiting of mushrooms within two weeks sometimes even, um, but then they'll only produce like once or twice and, um, and then they'll be spent. And then you can use that. Sometimes people take those spent, uh, what they call mushroom blocks, which is just like sawdust basically um, colonized by the fungus and then fruited. Um, people will take that afterwards and bring it into their gardens to make beds or just to um, help with nutrients um, kind of because there's a lot of nutrients within that that's being released as the fungus is decomposing. Um, but you can also create these things uh, that they call microremediation barriers. So these barriers to runoff um, in different types of um, animal farming and things like that. Sometimes they use these types of things to help with um, different types of uh, uh, pathogens and different types of microbes that can be very uh, harmful to humans or uh, the ecosystem, things like Staphylococcus and pneumocystis and um, a lot of different fungi it can be really um, amazing at consuming these things. They use them as food and they pull them out of this water source. Um, so you can create different types of um, mycelium filters and things like that. A lot of people are working with those and different species with that. Um, but also I wanna just briefly mention, um, I'm definitely not an expert in this realm, but if you're interested in, in um, working with the local microorganisms in the soil already, um, you know, a lot of people are introducing different microorganisms that they get from the store. Um, but in a lot of cases, those don't really survive um, because there's so much going on in the soil already. Um, there are all these things that are already in that niche. Um, so if you can um, form these connections with the local indigenous microorganisms, um, you can really benefit um, this Korean natural farming methods. Um, I would definitely look that up. Um, they, they, call, they use a lot of acronyms, IMO, indigenous microorganisms. KNF, Korean National Farming. Um, so they are some really, really amazing methods. Um, some great videos on YouTube of how to do this. Really simple. Basically you're using uh, like a grain like rice and you're uh, cooking it and then leaving it out in the environment um, near your garden or near where you're growing things, maybe on the edge of the woods. And then this material like rice is being um, colonized by all these different microorganisms that are right there that are releasing spores and maybe coming out of the soil um, to decompose that a little bit. And then you can take that and you bring it through this process where you're expanding it and using these microorganisms and feeding them. And then you introduce them into your garden, into your plants, and they can be really, really amazing. People have found just like super, super amazing benefits from uh, this, this kind of uh, method. Um, kind of regenerative. So we do all this degenerative farming and degenerative systems within our uh, agriculture. Um, and it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, it's 
it's easy in terms of being able to produce for huge populations and we have huge populations on this planet and it's hard um, to produce enough food for all of them. So we kind of fall into these methods that unfortunately um, are really degenerative. Um, I also kind of at the end here, if you are foraging, always uh, forage responsibly, leave things behind um, so that they can sporulate. Um, but there is endless potential. Um, we didn't even talk about medicine, myco materials, so that you can create materials using mycelium. Uh, there are a bunch of companies doing that. Um, remediation, uh, to kind of briefly mention that, uh, there's a lot of potential there. Um, and then all these things that we rely on that we don't realize, uh, fungi for bread and cheese, alcohol, soy sauce, salami, citric acid, it goes on and on and on. There are all these different things that we rely on fungi for. Um, but you can also really consume them in your daily life. So I really recommend, and we're going to get into Q and A very soon here, but, um, I recommend consuming mushrooms because of all these beneficial compounds within them. So mushroom produce, mushrooms produce um, many, many different compounds, but there are two major groupings that are often studied. Um, and they are the polysaccharides, which are water soluble. And they're basically just these configurations of simple sugars, um, often different configurations of glucose. Um, and they, within mushrooms are in these formations that we call beta D-glucans. And these beta D-glucans, um, beta glucans are a type of sugar, basically uh, more complex sugar. Um, and they're found in all different types of organisms, all different types of things that we eat. Um, but the ones within mushrooms um, are known to stimulate the immune system in all these different ways. And they can be really great for uh, your gut immune system. They can be really great for stimulating and modulating the immune system in different ways. So a lot of these compounds really help instead of just boosting the immune system, um, you know, in certain situations, like with COVID, for instance, um, there are situations where your body creates such an immense immune response that your uh, cells start attacking themselves. Um, once the immune system has, you know, it's killed what's there that it's made this response to, but it's just oh, out of control, created such a big response that it starts attacking your own cells. And so with different types of fungi ratio, I definitely recommend, especially taking right now, um, can really help with modulating the immune system. Um, then there's this other major group of compounds we call terpenes and triterpenes, and they are alcohol soluble. So when you're consuming products that are um, made from different types of mushrooms, um, it's good to get something that they call dual extracted, meaning that they extracted the alcohol compounds and they extracted the water, compa uh, water soluble compounds and they brought them together into one product. Um, so you're getting both of those different groups of compounds, as well as all these other different uh, soluble compounds. Um, also, when you're consuming or buying mushroom products, I would definitely, there are a lot of, so there's this massive boom of mushroom products going on right now. Um, people are getting very interested in realizing the amazing benefits. Um, like we said before, we share 50% of our DNA with fungi. So it makes sense that a lot of these compounds really work very well with us. Um, but uh, I would definitely recommend knowing that you're getting some situations they're just grinding up the mycelium and unfortunately they're growing that mycelium on grains and they can't pull it away from the grains so they just grind up the grain and you'll get a product that's like 70 to 80 percent starches from grain um, which isn't really all that good necessarily and it's hard because a lot of people will take these uh, products maybe that are a little bit more cheap uh, and they won't feel any benefits and then they won't go back and want to try anything new or any other mushroom products that really might be able to help them. Um, so I would always recommend getting something that says fruiting bodies. So that means it has actual mushroom in it. Um, mycelium can be really great as well, but I really make sure that you get those fruiting bodies as well in there um, when you're buying mushroom products. But I think we're getting just about time to, uh, to uh, do some Q and A, but just really quickly, some beautiful mushrooms that I find in my area. Um, these are all photos that I've taken last year. Some beautiful chicken of the woods there. Um, the spiny mushrooms called uh, Foliota squarosoides, really beautiful um, fungus. Um, we have some slime molds, that pink, beautiful, uh, they call it pink toothpaste slime mold. I really love that one. Um, you can push it with your finger and it squishes out like, tooth, like pink toothpaste. Um, slime molds are really interesting. We could go into a whole down a whole rabbit hole with slime molds. They're not in the fungal kingdom anymore. They were taken out um, because of some of the phases of their life cycle that actually move around. They were clocked at the fastest of any microorganism. Then we also have some 
uh, phosphorescent fungi, these fungi that produce phosphorus compounds that can glow in the dark. There are a few that grow in uh, New York as well. Um, some of the edibles that I found this past year. Then we have some deadly things. The destroying angel is one of the most deadly mushrooms in the world. It grows pretty abundantly in this area. It's in with, within that um, Amanita grouping that we talked about. Um, and this mushroom uh, can kill you very quickly. Um, typically, you can eat it um, and you really don't feel too bad at first. Sometimes you get a little bit of gastrointestinal um, but then uh, about 24 hours later, you really start to have these uh, systems shut down almost. It can hit your liver so hard, the toxins basically break down your liver and uh, you can die very quickly. So always know what you're eating. If you're unsure, don't eat it. Uh, if in doubt, throw it out is one of the uh, things that we often say in the fungal community. But uh, reach out if you're interested. If you find something you think is edible, um, reach out to me or to somebody else that knows about fungi or um, you know, this is the way how you, this is how you learn about these things. And there are some really amazing edibles out there that um, really don't have very many lookalikes that could hurt you. So um, some other different types of weird, funky things that I've found. And this is actually, um, this is a SEM, so a scanning electron microscope uh, or a micrograph. So we use, uh, it's a way to basically look at the surface of things very, very up close um, by bouncing uh, electrons off of it. And this is actually, um, if anybody's ever seen powdery mildew on a leaf, it's this like white structure that you see, it's a mycelium structure um, on the leaf. And if you look really closely, you can often see if it's at full maturity, these tiny, tiny black dots. And that's what you see here in these clumps, these clusters, those are the fruiting parts um, that form the spores. Um, and these fully mature ones, these ones are these crazy appendages. Um, and so all that mycelium, that branching structure is the mycelium, that white structure you'd see on the leaf if you look at powdery mildew. Questions? So we'll come out of sharing and we can answer questions if people would like. Did we actually go on time? We're actually not so bad. I would, I would love to ask you about um, the method you were talking about, about creating mycelium with um, soaking the cardboard and chopping up your old mushroom bits and trying to create the mycelium. I was trying to do that and I didn't find any real information. I didn't look that hard, but I wasn't oh. sure if I had it wet enough. I, you know, I kind of had it in the fridge and nothing really happened. And so. Okay. Uh, what fungus did you use? I had a trumpet mushroom that I had grown. A trumpet. That you had grown. Oh, um, so that was trumpet. Would that have been like king oyster trumpet? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that could work. Um, a lot of oysters work really well. So um, you do want a good amount of moisture on it. Um, typically with mushroom substrates when you're growing, and you may know this, um, you want it to be like to where if you squeeze it, you don't have more than like two or three droplets of moisture coming out. If you squeeze it as hard as you can with your hand, but you also want you know, enough moisture to where it's almost dripping. Um, but uh, yeah, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Uh, I would cut it up very small and do a good amount in there and then just leave it for, you know, a couple of weeks. But it's, it happens in some situations really well. Um, I don't know if the king oyster is really, really amazing at jumping off like that. Um, all fungi will do it eventually, but in some situations there, they have trouble um, maybe there's some other bacteria alongside them or something like that that's not allowing them to. Um, but maybe try with a, try with like an oyster species, like maybe golden oysters or like pink or blue oysters or something like that might be a little bit more vigorous jumping Actually, off there. Yeah, it was, it was blue oyster, but maybe I just blue. didn't get it wet enough. Yeah. It may have been that. Um, try again. You know, sometimes they're a little finicky. But uh, if you look up on the internet, I would look up a uh, mushroom burrito. Okay. And if you look up trad cotter, T-R-A-D-D, cotter, C-O-T-T-E-R, trad cotter, he's the one that kind of developed that. And he also does this uh, stacking method where it's like similar, but he's stacking uh, layers of the cardboard and doing that. If you don't know who trad cotter is and you never heard of him, he is the number one person I would say to look up. He's doing the most amazing things in the world of fungi. Um, he's created this just really quickly one of the amazing things. Uh, so fungi create these um, antibiotic compounds and they're very unique um, antibiotic compounds in response to the specific bacteria that they come in contact with. So he's created this 
um, way that he uh, grows mycelium in a bag on a substrate. And then he can take a swab from somebody who's suffering from a bacterial infection. He can take that bacteria and introduce it into the bag. And then the fungus mycelium will create a unique antibiotic specifically to that bacteria. And then they can pull that out as a liquid. And apparently you can dilute by 500 times and still have uh, beneficial effects for actually killing that bacteria. And uh, he's developed this uh, in the last few years, I guess. And it's um, eventually it may be like the future of medicine because of all these kind of, we're finding bacteria that are developing resistance to all these different antibiotics. But if you can create an antibiotic that is unique to that specific bacteria, it's a uh, you know, game changer. There's a, uh, a question in the chat. What are yeah. some of the best places in NYC to find mushrooms? And is, is that right after it rains or a day or two after? So it just it depends on the species of fungi. But yeah, typically a day or two, a couple of days after um, it rains, you will start to find things. Um, it's just kind of starting. So in the colder seasons, um, fleshy mushrooms, so mushrooms that um, are about 80 or 90 percent moisture, just like we are. So things that are uh, typically edible mushrooms or things that are fleshy don't really start until around now or a little bit before now. Um, so we're just starting to see more of those fleshy mushrooms. But in New York City, I would definitely um, check out all these parks. Um, a really amazing resource, though, um, if you look up Gary Linkoff, um, he passed away a few years ago. He is a mushroom guru. Uh, Linkoff, I think it's L-Y-N-C-O-F-F, -F, Gary Linkoff. Um, he had a whole, you can still find his uh, website, and he was from New York City. He was involved with uh, creating the Audubon Society Mushroom Field Guide. Um, and he was really a guru. A lot of people studied underneath him. He was self-taught. Um, and he made a point to travel around to every single park within New York City um, every year and collect mushrooms in every single park um, all time, like all year long. Um, I would definitely look him up and he would have a lot of resources on his website and things that you might find in the parks. Any other questions? Uh well, going back to Bushwick Inlet Park, um, you know, I, I definitely there's uh, some mushrooms and uh, stuff growing, especially today we noticed under some leaves, I could see the mycelium, but is there any way, should we try to um, encourage it to grow in areas of the, of the um, garden that looks sort of barren, that's seems to be sort of suffering would we want to take some of those leaves and move them around or would we be disrupting an already a process of communication between trees that we wouldn't want to mess around with or <laughs> that's a good question so um i mean you could bring over material that is decomposing um so a lot of times this those fungi that are decomposing that material aren't really in relationship with the plants like a mycorrhizal um, so you could transport them and they could release different types of nutrients because they're breaking down the leaves and things like that. Um, but yeah, things within those leaves, like different spores and stuff might come over and help and be beneficial. But if you're really looking to, um, really help different parts of your garden, um, to be more connected, it would, I would really look towards that, uh, Korean natural farming method. Definitely. Maybe yeah, we questions. could have a workshop and figure out how to do that and bring them. Is that, a, is that something I, I, I wasn't, I didn't write it all down, but I know we can research it, but is that something you could do? You could have a workshop and sort of start the process and then. Yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I think that would be great. Um, personally, I'm not um, too experienced in these methods, um, but it, they're pretty simple methods. So you could like watch a video, for instance, and probably be able to, to lead that workshop. They're very, very simple. It's basically just using like sugar to feed these indigenous microorganisms and then expanding them a few times. And then at that point you can use them in your gardens. And um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen some pretty amazing things that people have done with it. And how do you know if it's indigenous or, or you, it's indigenous because you actually take it from the garden itself? Yeah, you take it from the garden or from, uh, so in a lot of cases, you're trying to introduce them into your garden. So they might not be in high abundance there already. So 
a lot of cases you'll typically if you have like a woods or some trees on the edge a lot of times people are taking them kind of from the edge of the woods um, getting those kind of mycorrhizae that are growing on the edge of the woods in the woods sometimes people are taking them just inside of the woods and getting a lot of those beneficial things because um, kind of in our lawns and in our yards we've done a lot of different things and manicured and introduced different compounds and things like that over the years that have kind of changed the um, community of microorganisms under the soil so you want to kind of get some of that native that uh, natural ecosystem um, those microorganisms into your ecosystem of your garden um, kind of by grabbing them right on the edge of the woods or right in the woods um, yeah um, with uh, harmful mus mushrooms or poisonous mushrooms quote unquote is it possible that they could be harmful just from you know surface contact or do they need to be in ingested or or what about breathing that's, breathing in spores right right that's a really good question um, a lot of people have that question so um, poisonous mushrooms uh, deadly mushrooms you can touch them as much as you want um, you're not going to have any uh, harsh benefits they have to be um, digested by your system in order to be harmful to you um, so you can pick up the deadliest mushrooms and be totally fine as long as you're not putting them into your body. Um, in terms of like spores and things that could harm you, um, in a lot of cases, when spores are harming you, it's typically things like molds that often have different types of uh, what we call mycotoxins. They create these toxins. Um, but in terms of like different mushrooms and things that might be deadly, you don't have any worries of breathing in those spores. They're not gonna, um, they're not gonna poison you or anything like that. That's a good question. And in a lot of cases, like uh, not always, but um, in some cases, um, taste of different types of mushrooms can actually be a good identifier. So like you never want to swallow anything that you don't know what it is, but um, different types of mushrooms, usually mushrooms that have gills. If I don't know what it is, I don't usually taste, but things like boletes that have like pores or pubes, um, those things you can, you know, take a little nibble of, spit it out to get an idea because in some cases they'll be bitter or they'll be spicy. Um, there's some really amazing ones within this grouping they call lactarius, which are these milky, milky caps. They create these uh, milky latex substance, and some of them are spicy, really, really spicy. So like a fireball, and you, you taste that, and you get this like fire in your mouth, and some of them are really bitter. Um, there are some that are really sweet in, in uh, flavor. Um, there's a candy cap that uh, has this amazing like brown sugary kind of smell and taste to the uh, latex. So in some situations, uh, a little bit of a taste can give you an idea for identification. But again, be very careful, don't swallow things. And I don't recommend like, for instance, things that are amanitas. Amanitas have uh, typically a ring around the stalk and they have this kind of very bulbous base that they call the vulva or the, um, that's like kind of the main name for it, or the universal veil. And um, I just, I stay away from those, like eating those or anything like that. They're beautiful, you know, sometimes I, I find them and I'll pick them for different uh, ecological purpose for identification purposes for telling kind of what's in the ecosystem there getting some diversity index but um, yeah. I always questions? thought that you really couldn't identify mushrooms without um, putting I don't know sort of capturing the spores you know by putting them under a glass on a piece of white paper mm -hmm. and then I mean, I never did it because it just sounded too hard, but I never ate a mushroom out of the woods because <laughs> yeah. Vermont, they were cautioning against it. Yeah, I mean, you definitely have to be cautious and uh, know what you're eating. Again, I said previously, there are a lot of great edible mushrooms that don't have any lookalikes. Um, but yeah, a spore print, like you were referring to, is a very good way to identify if you don't really have an idea of what it is, it'll put you on the right path. So um, different families and groupings and genus uh, of different fungi have different colored spore prints. And uh, don't be afraid of making one there. They can be beautiful. Sometimes they're really amazing. Like uh, you'll see like dark purple black or black ones. Uh, the dark purple ones are also often in the uh, psychedelic grouping. Um, there are some really beautiful, uh, there's just a two that form green spore prints. That's very unique. Um, a lot of them are kind of like pale or pinkish in color. 
Um, and they can be beautiful because they're kind of like they form with the uh, structure. So if it has gills, they'll form these really beautiful kind of uh, branching uh, spore print. Let's see, I might even have one. I think I have one over here that I can just pull up real quick. And there was a but, question in the chat. Do you know of any good apps that are useful for identifying mushrooms or would you recommend having a field guide? And I definitely recommend a field guide. Um, there are a couple apps out there. I haven't found any that are really very good for identification. Um, I would definitely recommend uh, there's a Mushrooms of the Northeast field guide that's really good by uh, Baroni, B-O-R-N-I. Uh, that one's really great and it's like $20. Um, but also online, there's some really good resources. So there's a website called Mushroom Expert. That's the number one that I would really recommend um, for identification and information. Um, and they have uh, dichotomous keys on that website. So you can, for instance, if you don't know what a dichotomous key is, it basically tells you, gives you features of a mushroom. And it says, if it has this features, go to this number. And it says, if it doesn't have the features, go to this number. And you go down and you then read the next one. And if it has this feature and it takes you on and on and eventually you can get an idea of what the mushroom is. But here's a little spore print, if you can see that. Yeah. But yeah, they can be really pretty. I know somebody that uses, makes different art. He, uh, a couple different people actually. I just met somebody who does this really cool stuff. I need to look him, but he uh, does these cutouts. He like creates these stencils and then he puts them on another piece of paper. So like, for instance, he create like a, a butterfly cutout, the shape of butterfly. And then he puts that on a piece of paper and then he places all the mushrooms on top of that. And they spore print through this stencil so you get this beautiful shape and then these amazing mushroom spore print shapes within them. Really pretty. That's super cool. Hey, we're running out of time, but we have one mm -hmm. more question uh, that seems pretty interesting. I know you sort of talked a little bit about it, but um, Monica asks, can you talk about the use of fungus in medical research happening now? Oh my gosh, there's so much, so, so much. Um, there are a lot of really amazing mush mushrooms. Um, we could talk about it for days, but um, there are a few that have created compounds that they've um, utilized um, in the past, like for instance, penicillin and cyclosporin, which is an amazing thing for, uh, they found that uh, using this, it's an immune suppressant drug and using that during uh, organ transplants can actually increase the likelihood that the organ will take to the body um, by like some huge, huge percentage. Um, but those are some things that have been found in the past. But um, a lot of the research these days is happening kind of like on these polysaccharides that I talked about and the triterpenes and the effects on the body. Um, and they all of different fungi produce different ones. So one of the really big ones that's being researched right now is cordyceps. And cordyceps produces a lot of different compounds. It's a parasitic fungus. Um, I actually make a, um, I make tinctures uh, dual extracted mushroom extracts and I make a cordyceps extract and, um, it's a really amazing fungus for endurance and stamina. Um, a lot of people are using it for that finding it can really help with focus. It's one of the um, mushrooms that actually I find that I really notice benefits from using almost immediately. I take an extract and I find that I can feel the focus almost as if like my brain clears a little bit and, um, I have some friends and actually my dad was finding it was helping really a lot with fatigue and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, there are so many different fungi that are being studied for those polysaccharides and triterpenes. But um, if you're interested further, I can definitely um, point you towards different um, papers and things like that. Or if that's too dense, we can just chat about it someday or um, reach out, please. Um, my website, I think I, I can put in the chat. You can also email me. It was in the um, at the end of that uh, presentation there, but let's see, my website is mycophilic.net, and you can check that. You can go there and uh, find some information about me and contact me through that. Um, I do some consultations for people that want to grow on their property, outdoors or indoors, and uh, do some education and workshops and things through that. But yeah, please reach out. I'd love to talk more, Monica. Great. Well, Wonderful. Seems like we're at the end of um, 
our our time with you, Luke. It, it's been so illuminating and fun to listen to. I really great. I appreciate it so much. It it's really um, you know, makes you want to dive in, learn more. And you gave us some good ideas about ways to start our own our own journey in education. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah and really look up Suzanne Samard that was one of the people I mentioned she is really just blowing my mind in the world of mycorrhizae and finding that she can track uh sugars from one plant to another plant through the fungi she's mm-hmm. doing some amazing studies and finding that she can actually oh, so so crazy she has a bunch of TED talks that you can watch thank you so much though all right thank you I really appreciate it it was great talking with you and I'll send the link to their recording when it's posted through uh, Eventbrite. So wonderful! I was actually going to ask if it was recorded. I, I meant to yeah. hit the recording, and I did not. So thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good thank night. you. Have a good night. Cheers. Much love.